Well, hello there, City Church family and friends. Welcome to day number 17, Peter. We are in Luke chapter 17, which we'll get to in a moment. But we wanted to loop back into chapter 16 and deal with the parable at the end of Luke 16 that involves a wealthy man and a guy named Lazarus. And there's the sense where one goes to away from the Lord in death, and there's this parable Jesus teaches. So as we pick up that parable, our interest lies in the last verse of that parable from Luke chapter 16, where it says, and he said to them, if you do not listen to Moses and the prophets, which is what we spoke about yesterday, was the law and the prophets. By the way, if you didn't catch yesterday's devotional, I think it was extremely important to catch that one. So we encourage you to listen to the devotional for Luke 16, and then now move towards 17. It says, if you do not listen to Moses and the prophets, which is the law and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. So Peter, as we're exiting chapter 16, we wanted to loop around and catch that. So yeah. share your thoughts. Well, um, if there's anything new in the New Testament is Jesus' resurrection. And oftentimes, again, as we talked about yesterday, sometimes what's new in the New Testament makes what's in the Old Testament look old. Yes. And we don't have to deal with it. But here, Jesus is saying that his own resurrection is only properly understood in the context in the law and the prophets because the rich man who is burning in hell across a great chasm from the from Lazarus who is in the bosom of Abraham says well send Lazarus to go tell my brothers yeah and he says because if someone came back from the dead they'd listen and Jesus is saying no no no, they have well, Abraham says but Jesus is saying they have the law and the prophets they yes. don't need a resurrection they won't believe in a resurrection if they don't have the law and the prophets and I think what Jesus is saying here is not quite that People won't believe that it's true that someone comes back from the dead, but they won't understand the significance of someone coming back from the dead without the Old Testament story. And yeah. um, in the last two years, based on a couple particular preachers, it's been popular to use the phrase, we need to unhitch our faith from the Old Testament. Correct. Yeah. And what's often thought is that like, well, we center our faith in the resurrection so we can get rid of all that Old Testament stuff. And right. on the one hand, I get that because um, oftentimes trying to historically prove Old Testament history is proven. Well, and also um, some of the things that happen in the Older yeah. Testament become very problematic for the Newer Testament. And so people are saying, let's just unhitch, right. let's take the resurrection and go. And that Old Testament stuff is often considered maybe more violent or darker or more complicated uh, mm -hmm. or more divisive. But here, it's Jesus' teaching on the Law and the Prophets that loops, loops him to his own mm -hmm. resurrection. And that's just something that simply should not be missed. And then he starts talking about, in chapter 17, about temptations to sin. Uh, and we want to talk there, I think, about forgiveness. We do. So we, we really want to kind of sink our teeth into forgiveness in this devotional video. So we're picking up Luke 17, the latter half of verse 3, where Jesus says the following. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And Jesus replied, if you have the faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to the mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea and it will obey you. And so what Jesus is doing is in the context of forgiveness, his disciples say, oh no, we don't have enough faith to do that. And Jesus says, oh yes, you do. You only need the faith the size of a mustard seed in order to forgive the way Jesus is calling you us to forgive. So Peter, what are our thoughts about that as we're taking a look at forgiveness? Yeah, I just think um, uh, you know, the, the most important theologian of the 20th century, a guy named Karl Barth, said that the miracle that Christians can forgive ought to be enough to establish the truth of the entire faith. Mm. Uh, which I think is a way of illustrating how hard forgiveness is. Yes, and, and how important it is. And I think that yeah. it's understandable, because I have done it and will probably do it again, um, to believe or to hope that as I mature in faith, <laughs> forgiveness just gets easier. And that yeah. maybe, you know, I can't forgive right now, but there's a further horizon where when I get to that point, I'll be able to forgive, like when I have more faith or I'm better. And... I think what Jesus is saying here is uh, that as opposed to faith, which is a dependence on God, a reliance on God, mm -hmm. 
Forgiveness seems to be more of a decision because he goes, mm -hmm. look, you've got to forgive over and over again. Yes. And the disciples go, well, then increase our faith. And he goes, it's not a faith problem. Like if you had that much faith, you'd be And fine. a mustard seed is supposedly the smallest seed known that grows into a huge bush or right. a huge tree. There, yeah. uh, oh, there is some TV show that used to run like NBC or something, had some snotty little kid who was like, what, well, shouldn't Jesus know if he knows everything that an orchid is actually the smallest seed in the world? Which, I don't know, maybe. But the point is, is that in Israel at this time, mustard seeds are considered, the, uh, they're what like atoms are for us, even though right. atoms aren't the smallest thing, but they're right. the smallest right. thing. And so Jesus, I think, is trying um, to do this thing that good pastors do, where they refuse to allow your problem to become their problem, they just help you reframe it as your problem in the correct way. Correct. And so yes. the disciples go like, well, if you want us to forgive, then get us to forgive. And he goes like, actually, that's not a me issue. That's kind of a you issue. Right. Um, and so he hands it back to them. And of course, we believe that Jesus's own life and career and his work on the cross changes our own capacity to forgive. But mm -hmm. I think what he's saying is it's not about belief. It's a capacity you have. Right. And I think it's important to remember, too, and I... I find myself thinking about this a lot. Almost always, Peter, if we were to get a group of people in the room who are followers of Jesus and ask them, you know, what's the most important thing in the kingdom of God? Almost everyone would say love at some point. If it's not ranked one, two, or three, it'll, it almost always is. I agree with that, but here's what I believe. I believe that forgiveness is actually the currency of the kingdom of God. I believe that. I know that love is important, but... Here is what we're finding, that forgiveness is the thing that allows love to function in a healthy way. Um, forgiveness is kind of the entrepreneurial bedrock of love. It's the thing that we learn to do because we believe, Peter, and I think this is what Jesus is teaching, is it's almost as though, in many ways, forgiveness is an, an equation that we're called to plug into. That if someone comes to me after having sinned and asks me to forgive them, I do that. I forgive them. And so I have come to the realization in my own life, much by looking at the crucifixion of Jesus and Holy Week and Jesus on the cross, that forgiveness is really the grease of the kingdom. It's the currency of the kingdom. It's the fuel of the kingdom. It's the thing that really makes the kingdom of God work. And when we look at the Lord's Prayer, as we did a couple of weeks ago, we find that, you know, forgive as I forgive others. There's something here, Peter, about forgiveness that Jesus brings it as one of the central primary things of the kingdom of God. And yet when the disciples hear it, it kind of freaks them out. We realize too that the number seven isn't that you sit there and you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Peter has sinned against me. Now he comes with sin number eight. And when he does, I finally get to punch him, right? Seven just means perfection in the kingdom of God. So that number in essence becomes limitless. Any other thoughts that we have? about forgiveness not on forgiveness but about the kingdom of god okay yes yeah um the other th teaching that we want to tackle here yes. is the kingdom of god teaching in verse 20 and um if you come away with nothing else from these devotional videos i would consider to win if you came away believing that the kingdom of god was the center of jesus's message mm -hmm. that's something that i believe very strongly um as uh, a an important maybe the most important framing principle for reading the gospel. Mm -hmm. So what we have starting in verse 20 is Jesus' teaching, one of Jesus' many teachings on the kingdom of God. And I had never read this before. It was the summer after my third year in college. I was living with Dick and Ruth Foth in Fort Collins, Colorado, a stone's throw from the foothills of the Rockies. And every evening, um, hum humidity would come off of the plains and hit the Rockies and billow into these giant thunderheads. And you could sit there at reliably every night and watch lightning strike the Rockies. Mm. And so I'm reading my Bible and sitting there and there mm -hmm. asleep in bed. And I came across this and, it, as, and he said to his disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. And they will say, look, here, look there or look here. Do not go and follow them for as lightning flashes and lights up the sky and a strike of lightning hit one of the Rockies from one side to another so the Son of Man will be in his day. Yeah. And I don't know if that's a point to make, but it has really endeared this verse to me. Um, huh. But surely the history of religion has shown us that at various points, people have stood up and said something like this. The climax of world history or um, the point of our faith or the long trajectory of the human race 
is climaxing in me and you have to believe in me or in my movement or what we're doing or what's going on here. You have to believe in that. And if you don't believe in that, you'll miss it. And Jesus is saying, that's not how I'm going to come back. Mm. Jesus came to earth to inaugurate, to start the kingdom of God. And he says, and if you're a part of my movement, there's going to come days when you want to see the son of man. Right. Like you want to see me in all of my glory come and consummate my kingdom. And there are going to be people who are going to claim to be me or to see me consummating right. my kingdom. Or political leaders or yeah. others. Yeah. Don't believe them. When I come, trust me, you won't miss it. It's right. sort of what he's saying. Right, right. And so for those of us who journey uh, over long periods of time with Jesus, um, who maybe find ourselves in tough situations as we are now, when we long for that moment where God just breaks through and makes mm -hmm. new, mm -hmm. I think oftentimes we might get scared that we're going to miss, we're going to miss the new thing God is doing. So we have to, and Jesus is just letting us know, you can't miss it guys. Like right. when I come, yes. it'll be like lightning. It'll be so obvious. Yes. Yes. Well, as we are in the midst of this COVID-19 crisis, I think there it's, it's a comfort to us to know that Jesus is clear. You're going to know you won't miss it. It's going to be as obvious as all get out. And so don't run around nervous that you're going to miss this thing. And when he shows up and does what he's going to do, it will be obvious to all of us. So Peter, any other departing thoughts before we exit this chapter? Anything else that comes to mind? Okay. So as we look at it, I, I would like for us to loop back around again um, just to the topic of forgiveness as we close in prayer. I'd also like to encourage you that if you have never gotten Rob Reamer's book, Soul Care, I want to encourage you to do that. Principle number four in his book is where he does an in-depth teaching on forgiveness. And I'd encourage you to go and get that book. Take a look at chapter four if you've struggled with forgiveness. I have found it to be one of the most applicable teachings that I've ever read. So we're going to conclude our time now in prayer. And Peter, would you pray specifically for people and with people who forgiveness is something that they're struggling with? And if the kingdom of God invading this world involves our forgiveness of others, not just us receiving forgiveness, but, uh, but us giving forgiveness to others, then this is a big kingdom of God issue. Yeah. So if you'll close us out in prayer. Yeah, let's pray. Jesus... Um... The ironic thing about praying about forgiveness is your teaching is that forgiveness is something that does not come by the increase of our faith. It's always there on offer to us. Um, and yet, Lord, it's clear that so many of us are not forgiving, and it's much easier to hold and cling to grudges than to forgive. And so if there's any wiggle room, Lord, between increasing our faith and helping us forgive, we invite you into it. Uh, but mostly, I pray that you would expand people's imaginations, God, for what it would look like to live without grudges, to live without bitterness, to live without unforgiveness, and that you'd make clear and desirable the call to be a group of people who forgive. In the name of the crucified God, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. We look forward to seeing you at tomorrow's video.